Hi everyone, welcome to Hub Bites. I'm Sunil Reggae, consultant psychiatrist. If you're new to this channel, we cover all things psychiatry and mental health related. So if that's your thing, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification button to be informed of other videos that come up. Today, we'll be talking about Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, ADHD. Now, as many of you would know that ADHD you know, sometimes raises a lot of controversy. Lots of people saying ADHD doesn't exist. Um, ADHD is underdiagnosed. ADHD is overdiagnosed. Now, we won't go into all of those debates. But essentially, when we think about ADHD, it consists of certain domains with a prominence of, of course, executive function and associated symptoms such as impulsivity, hyperactivity, um, that occur, right? Now, all of us have a frontal lobe. In fact, frontal lobe really differentiates us from animals, right? Through evolution, the frontal lobe started becoming uh, a lot more prominent. Um, and what that allowed us to do is to make decisions, the executive function improved, um, the multitasking, the attention, the concentration, the focus. And the frontal lobe also uh, helped us inhibit the primitive part of the brain so that we exercise better judgment, for example, that we can control our emotions a lot better, um, the emotional regulation component, etc. Essentially, the factors that make us humans. Now, when the frontal lobe is affected due to a range of reasons, there can be symptoms related to cognition, so attention, concentration problems, organization problems, Similarly, when the frontal lobe can't inhibit the limbic system adequately, the top-down inhibition, then it can result in things like impulsivity, hyperactivity, etc. So when we think about that, the combination has been given a term ADHD. So what I'll be talking about is what is, the uh, what is ADHD, how is it diagnosed, and what is treated. General principles, just overall. Okay. So firstly... Let's jump into it, look at what is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So ADHD is a neurodevelopmental disorder, primarily characterized by inattention and or hyperactivity impulsivity. So the cognitive component and that hyperactivity impulsivity component that I talked about. You can think about it as arising from two different components, right? Now I've done a detailed article in psychscenehub.com on the neurobiology of ADHD and there is a lot there. But I've kind of simplified it for you. When the frontal lobe is affected on its own, cognition is affected, inattention, concentration, decision-making abnormalities, organizational problems. But the frontal lobe, when it can't inhibit the limbic system, then you get these heightened emotional arousal symptoms as well. And what's important is frontal lobe, by the way, is swimming and dopamine. And this is one of the disorders where dopamine plays a very, very important part. The next component, ADHD-related impairments continue into adolescence, so it's a neurodevelopmental uh, disorder, starts quite early, moves into adolescence and young adulthood, causing academic impairment, low self-esteem deficits in occupational outcomes, and lower adaptive functioning. Now, interestingly, as the development of the frontal lobe is slower and less matured than the typical development, it means that the neurodevelopmental delay to the prefrontal cortex makes automatically controlling and filtering attention, behaviors, emotions so much harder. And we see that in children. Children have a smaller frontal lobe, not as well functioning, and therefore can have these temper tantrums. Not to say adults can't have it, but it's linked to that you know, frontal lobe. So we see that kids children's development is different, the judgment's affected, all those frontal lobe functions tend to be affected, tend to be distracted, they change from one thing to the other, right? The focus, concentration improves as time goes by. But everyone's frontal lobe develops at different times. There is also gender differences, the female protective hypothesis. So I've written an article on gender differences in ADHD, hopefully I'll do a video another time. But females have, estrogen tends to be, testosterone is the culprit, Estrogen tends to be protective. So it actually protects the brain from the unmasking of these symptoms. And it's a double-edged sword. So on the one hand, females tend to have a lower incidence of the typical ADHD. You know, some say that, you know, female AD, ADHD in females presents differently, more with emotional arousal symptoms. But generally, on the one hand, it can be protective for the development of ADHD symptoms. But on the other hand, it means that 
females may be misdiagnosed or diagnosed much later because their symptoms may occur later on due to this female protective hypothesis. Then there is the cerebral lateralization theory. This is really interesting in the sense that testosterone actually results in retardation of the development of the left hemisphere compared to the right. And in some cases, this is more exaggerated, and hence why we see um, ADHD difference males to females with males having higher preponderance, most likely due to testosterone, this lateral lateralization theory where there is a slight um, break on the left hemisphere developing compared to the right. And that break sometimes can be exaggerated in some individuals and can result in um, ADHD. So these are some of the neurodevelopmental sort of hypotheses. What are the risk factors? Now, genes, this is one of the most heritable disorders. Now, heritable is a very different term from hereditary, okay? So heritable means that the genetic influence on the disorder tends to be high. It doesn't mean that just because a parent has it, the child's guaranteed to have it. No, that's not heritable. It means that the genetic contribution to this um, illness tends to be high, the variance. Um, and this is one of the most heritable disorders. So generally you find if an individual's got ADHD, we often find a family member that might have similar traits or symptoms. Very, very common. Next, environmental toxins such as lead. Uh, maternal influences, so exposure to, so there's some evidence with exposure to, um, say, alcohol, exposure to smoking is associated with ADHD. There might also be nutritional deficiencies on its own, but also during maternal, um, uh, uh, sort of uh, during pregnancy, right? So nutritional deficiencies, and this is, becomes crucial. You might recall that the video I did on the clinical evaluation, practical evaluation of ADHD on this channel, where I talked about ruling out medical conditions, iron deficiency. So I find in clinical practice, vitamin D, B12, folate, iron deficiency, thyroid, as very, very common issues in individuals with ADHD, even in adolescents, and um, of course in, in adults as well. And then we have environmental influences. This could be stresses, um, you know, a workload, because remember the frontal lobe, it's not only about the, the brain itself, but also about the external stresses that come on board. So what are the domains? The key domains are inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity, or both, okay? So inattention, when we think about the criteria, these are the criteria, we have six or more of the following symptoms have persisted for at least six months. to so a degree that is inconsistent with developmental level, and that negatively impacts directly on social, academic, occupational activities. Now, for older adolescents and adults, at least five symptoms are required. So children, this, adults, and older adolescents, five. So when we look at inattention, these are some of the examples. Now, I'll, uh, in ADHD in adults, I'll show you, I'll cover um, some of the other symptoms that can occur. Um, and the reason why I covered that is because ADHD can easily be misdiagnosed in adults as a range of other disorders. ADHD in adults presents very differently. Not clear cut, you know, often presents, patients will come with substance use disorders. They might come with reckless behavior. They might come because they're having relationship problems. They might come because they're depressed, um, because their work uh, performance has dropped down significantly. All these other things, and I'll talk about some of those examples. But so let's look at this criteria that have been mentioned. Uh, so in children, often fails to give close attention to details or makes careless mistakes in schoolwork, at work or other activities. Often has difficulty sustaining attention in tasks or play activities. Next, often does not seem to listen when spoken to directly. Mind seems elsewhere. Often does not follow through on instruction, fails to finish schoolwork or duties at the workplace. Often has difficulty organizing tasks and activities, such as managing sequential tasks, difficulty keeping materials messy, disorganized, etc., often avoids dislikes or is reluctant to engage in tasks that require sustained mental effort. Reviewing lengthy papers, writing an article, for example, preparing reports, etc. Often loses things necessary for tasks or activities. Is often easily distracted by extraneous stimuli and is often forgetful in daily activities. What's interesting here, though, is in inattention, we find that if they enjoy something, they can spend hours at it. But at other things that they find boring, for example, they get bored easily, one of the, you know, uh, questions in the questionnaire as well, um, they'll move on. Okay, so this is one of the things that we find. 
Hyperactivity and impulsivity, same. Six, six, and in uh, older adolescents, five. Often fidgets, taps, hands or feet or squirms in the seat. Often leaves seat in situations where seating is expected. Often runs about or climbs um, in situations where it's inappropriate. Often, so as you can see, in adolescents, adults may be limited to feeling restless. And this is one of the things that I cover because in adults, the hyperactivity goes down. Uh, only 30% of individuals, uh, only 30% of individuals tend to have hyperactivity that continues from adolescence to adulthood. So that's the reason why it can easily be missed. And that restlessness becomes more internalized and individuals can describe that more as anxiety. Next is often on the go, acting as if driven by a motor. Often talks excessively. Blurts out an answer before a question is completed. Often interrupts or intrudes on others and has difficulty waiting his or her turn. <clears throat> now, when we think about progression, um, essentially what, I've, what I'm trying to highlight here is that, you know, what we've got is behavioral disinhibition, emotional ability in preschool years. There could be hyperactivity, speech, language, coordination problems. This goes on to the full expression of ADHD. Uh, so some cases, smoking may be initiated. Then we have other things that can occur, substance use, marital discord, forensic issues, poor quality of life, ac accidents and traffic violations. So it kind of progresses unless it's sort of picked up. Um, so if not treated, the outcome gets worse. And as I mentioned earlier, what are the risk factors or the etiological, the causes, genes, fetal exposure, epigenetic changes, environmental influences, functional and structural brain abnormalities may occur. So this is something that has to be thought about in ADHD. It's a longitudinal evaluation that needs to be carried out. So in adults, one of the key criteria is that uh, there has to be evidence of ADHD in childhood as well. Okay, um, There is, however, some controversy there because uh, many individuals may actually have uh, ADHD just picked up in adulthood and a lot of it can be compensated uh, through avoidance in childhood so it's not easily picked up and then school reports might be absolutely fine or they might have had to take a huge amount of effort put a huge amount of effort to get through okay but it's taken a toll on other things so how is it diagnosed so there are a few things of course one can use the DSM manual right uh, to help diagnose but we tend to use a range of questionnaires so I tend to use the, if I'm adults, uh, the adult ADHD self-report scale, ASRS. There is the DIVA, D-I-V-A. Um, there is the Connors uh, questionnaire, both in children and in ad adolescents as well, that can be used. So there's a range of questionnaires that can be used to diagnose them. This is done for more a more structured sort of assessment. Um, now, uh, the adult ADHD self-report scale is a self-reported scale, but there are other objective ones, DIVA, for example, that you do with the patient. So the DSM presentations for adult ADHD, you've got inattentive, hyperactivity, hyperactive or combined presentation, as we talked about. So here are some of the things that we find that um, should be asked for in adults where we're suspecting ADHD. Now, when do we suspect ADHD in adults? Um, clinical practice, if a patient's not responding typically to treatment, their primary diagnosis, say depression or anxiety, uh, et cetera, and they're not responding the way I would expect them to. I should have ADHD at the back of the mind, just saying, hold on, have I taken a history appropriately? Do I need to backtrack and do it again, right? Do I need to take a collateral and see whether any of these ADHD criteria fulfill? So that's when the suspicion uh, comes up. Of course, you do that at the first appointment as well, but sometimes what happens is that some of the aspects potentially maybe minimized because other things are much more prominent. So they might find that the depression's improved. They might say, look, my mood's great. I'm feeling better. I'm not crying. I'm not feeling X, Y, Z, but my memory and attention concentration is still a problem. And you might go, hold on. Could this be an underlying disorder coexistent with uh, depression? So remember in adults, the important thing is they're, it's almost always comorbid as compared to in children, adolescents, where it's more circumscribed. So mind seems elsewhere, even in the absence of any ob obvious distraction. Starts tasks, quickly loses focus, easily sidetracked. Fails to finish tasks in the workplace. Reporting unrelated thoughts. Problems returning calls, paying bills, keeping appointments. I've had patients with racked up thousands and thousands of dollars in bills, for example. Problems, um, difficulty managing sequential tasks. A difficulty in keeping materials, belongings in order, messy, disorganized work. 
poor time management, tends to fail to meet deadlines, feeling restless, un unable or uncomfortable being still for an extended time, such, such as in restaurants or meetings, might be perceived by others as being restless or difficult to keep up with, butts into conversations, activities, might start using other people's belongings without permissions, might intrude into or take over what others are, are doing. And what's interesting here is that, um, you know, often individuals might also leave things to the last minute, failing to attend an appointment, turning up on the wrong day, losing their prescriptions and referrals, poor compliance with medications, ex particularly for multiple daily doses, poor compliance with referrals and tests, failure to undertake routine preventative health checks such as pap smears, presenting after having unprotected sex, possibly with pregnancy or sexually transmitted disease scare. So the impulsivity. University students requesting medical certificates to get extensions of assignments. Reporting feeling overwhelmed or procrastinating a lot. Maybe overly talkative. Lose focus, ask you to repeat things. Shifting repeatedly in the seat or jiggling legs. Drinking excessive quantities of caffeine or energy drinks or excessive smoking of cannabis. Um, cigarettes and, as you can see, cannabis as well. Smoking marijuana to, uh, to slow their mind and get to sleep. This is not uncommon. Poor sleep routine, circadian rhythm dysfunction tends to be very, very prominent, very high rates. Failing to pay their medical bill, uh, leaving their um, belongings behind in practice as well, losing their wallet, credit card, etc. So how is it treated? Now, general principles only, um, as usual, you know, none of this is medical advice. So non-medication treatments, psychotherapy can be um, evidence-based. Why? Because, say, CBT can be used practically to treat low self-esteem, depression, etc. Mindfulness to treat some of the emotional regulation, anger, discontrol, etc. Um, then behavioral therapy, right? Uh, so as I mentioned, anger, discontrol or behavioral activation, etc. Supplements. Omega-3 have good evidence, particularly where there's higher rates of EPA rather than DHA. So the proportion. Dietary modification, reducing artificial food dyes. This is more applicable for children, adolescents. Some adults might also report benefits. Exercise being suggested. We know exercise can be useful to improve cognitive function, improve the size of the hippocampus. It's part of neuroplasticity, increases BDNF levels. And then for children with ADHD, the parents are trained to improve how they interact with the children. So parent training, parent-child training. Uh, for adolescents and adults, we're looking at focusing on organizational skills, social behaviors, developing practical skills. Sometimes providing advice on software, right? Alarms, use of mobile can be extremely beneficial. There is insufficient evidence for meditation or neurofeedback. Although neurofeedback, uh, you know, some, it's not mainstream, but there is some evidence that for certain individuals, it could be useful um, in, in sort of brain training. It's something that we've covered um, as on the Psych Scene Hub. And I've also done an interview with an expert on neurofeedback. The most widely used medications to treat ADHD, as we know, there are stimulants and non-stimulants, okay? Some antidepressants as well, but in terms of stimulants, we have methyl, <coughs> sorry, methylphenidate and dexamphetamine. They come in short-acting version, long-acting version. It's really important to sort of tailor these, okay? Medications are considered first line in many cases in ADHD particularly in adults, right? And um, studies show the combination of psychotherapy or behavioral treatment plus medication may be more useful in, in children than just one or the other. But of course, this is, you know, a discussion with the doctor tailored to the individual because we don't want academic um, years to be impacted significantly, peer relationships to be impacted because they have consequences later on. So all of it needs to be looked at. The other thing in children, by the way, that needs to be looked at, I've covered it in the other video, you know, medical aspects, is ruling out, you know, adenoids, for example, for ADHD, enlarged tonsils, uh, sleep disturbances, sleep breathing disorders, same thing for adults, obstructive sleep apnea, restless leg syndrome, etc. So stimulants are very, very effective. We see that in clinical practice. For some, can be life-changing. Um, so, and in terms of side effects, of course, there are side effects, you know, got to monitor anxiety, insomnia, appetite change, loss of weight in children, growth retardation can occur, needs to be monitored closely, does not occur in everyone, but can occur. So therefore, close liaison with a pediatrician, um, it's important, growth chart monitoring, etc. Similarly, loss of appetite, etc. But they can be very useful, short acting versions, long acting versions can be used. Then we have non-stimulants, non-stimulants such as guanfacine, these are, you know, the alpha-2 
presynaptic antagonists uh, can be used. So guanfacine, clonidine, again, we've done a separate video on this, can help with sleep. And if stimulants are contraindicated or have side effects or ticks are there, then these non-stimulants can be used. So we have guanfacine, we have clonidine. Then we have antidepressants. Antidepressants such as atomoxetine is evidence-based in um, ADHD. Also bupropion is evidence-based in ADHD. But of course, uh, their side effects also need to be taken into account. So these are the general principles. Um, Non-medication treatment, we have supplements, we have medication, stimulants, non-stimulants, and antidepressants. So I hope that you found this video on ADHD helpful. If you did, if you found it useful, you've liked it, leave us a like, hit the like button, and don't forget to subscribe uh, so that I can see you next time. Um, take care, stay safe, and I look forward to see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.